George Hicks. For a good many years now, I've been bringing you stories on the radio about the people and events that make our America the great nation that it is. Now I want to tell you another of these stories. The story of what it takes to create a new steel mill right from scratch. What does it take to build a steel mill? Many things and many people. The mill I'm talking about bears the name of a man whose story is also typical of America. He was born the son of a coal miner, got his education through his own efforts, rose through the ranks in the steel industry. He is Benjamin F. Fairless, chairman of the board and chief executive officer of United States Steel Corporation, which has named its new mill for him the Fairless Works. This steel mill is located in Pennsylvania on the Delaware River. And this is the way the engineers saw it before work began. These are the ore docks where raw materials are unloaded. Iron ore is stored here. Coal goes into the coke ovens and a coal chemical plant. Iron is made in these blast furnaces and converted to steel and cast into ingots at nine open hearth furnaces. The ingots are heated for the first rolling in these soaking pit furnaces. At the primary mill, they are then rolled into smaller sections called blooms and slabs. The slabs are rolled into coils of strip on an 80 inch wide hot strip mill. Here is where the coil strip is cold rolled into sheets for automobile bodies and tin plates. Blooms are rolled into billets and small slabs on another continuous mill. Here is a bar mill where some of the billets become bars. Other billets are rolled into narrow steel strip called scalp, which is made into pipe. And to complete the mill, a water treatment plant, a powerhouse, laboratories, and general offices. The plant is so laid out as to allow for threefold expansion of facilities in the future. Tomorrow's, as well as today's needs, are planned for and built for. What did it take to build this mill? First of all, it took engineering. Planning and designing was a big challenge. For Fairless Works is the largest fully integrated steel mill ever to be built at one time. This planning wasn't accomplished overnight. It involved years of discussion, study, and work by the engineering department in cooperation with the commercial and operating departments. A site was chosen upon which to build the mill. The big bend of the Delaware River, involving more than 3,900 acres, was picked for a number of reasons. First of all, the mill would be near many users of steel. Then, too, being on the East Coast would be an advantage in receiving raw materials by barge and ship and sending out steel by water. There were excellent rail facilities and some of the finest highway routes in the eastern part of the United States. There was plenty of fresh water available, which is essential to steel making operations. And there were plenty of people in the community who would be good steel makers. The beginning of actual construction was marked by groundbreaking ceremonies on March 1st, 1951. United States Steel was given an official welcome to the community by the state of Pennsylvania, as well as by the neighboring state of New Jersey. Mr. Fairless, in his address, said to the new neighbors of Pennsylvania and New Jersey, you have already made us feel that we are welcome and established members of this community, and I hope with all my heart that you may always have reason to be as proud of us as we are proud and privileged to be your neighbor. Mr. Fairless dug the first fateful of earth. A core of bulldozers and earth moving equipment went into action, and the building of the new steel mill began. What did it take to build this steel mill? It took more than 10 million cubic yards of dirt to build up low spots for proper drainage. 
the earth was borrowed, leaving pits on the site for future slag disposal. This had to be done before construction could start. It took steel. 25,000 H-beams were driven deep into the earth to give a solid base upon which to build foundations. It took concrete. 700,000 cubic yards of it were poured for these foundations. It took experienced men to build furnaces and ovens and buildings. to run a steel mill. Enough water is used in this mill to supply a city of 1,375,000 people. It is cleaned as it comes from the Delaware River, purified again before it is returned. This meant building the most ultra-modern treatment plant that can be found in any steel mill in the world. It takes power, a lot of electric power. Enough power is used here to supply a city of 450,000 people. It meant building high-tension power lines. It takes transportation, 75 miles of railway lines, 20 miles of roads, and several miles of conveyors were built just to move materials within the plant. The ore, coal, limestone, dolomite, and other materials used by this mill each year would fill a single freight train stretching from Philadelphia to the southern tip of Florida. It took 10,000 men to build this steel mill, but these were only the men working at the site. Actually, some 200 prime contractors were needed. Each of these, in turn, handed out subcontracts to 10 other firms on the average and many of these used subcontractors. Many of these contractors were small businesses, having fewer than 500 employees. In fact, two contractors employed only two workers apiece. One other was an individual with no one else on his payroll. So behind the 10,000 men working at the site were nearly three million men in 27 different states who played some part in building the machinery, the equipment, and the facilities. Yes, more than a hundred thousand companies of every possible size were employed in building this mill. It stands as another monument to American enterprise and the close cooperation between big business and small business. It took more than 80,000 engineering drawings to guide the construction and installation work. 
but drawings alone were not enough. It took the continuous activity of a corps of engineers with skill and knowledge to supervise the transfer of concepts on paper into concrete and steel. A new steel mill acts as a magnet that can be expected to attract other new industries to the area. This means new capital investments, new job opportunities, new employment, new payroll. A new steel mill also attracts new housing. And Fairless Hills is typical of the growing new communities. It was designed by one of the nation's leading authorities on urban planning. Such a new community brings with it new schools and churches, new stores, medical facilities and recreation areas. And a growing community offers many more job opportunities. The effect of a new steel mill upon a whole area is tremendous. And as a new neighbor, it was important to see that everyone in the area understood and appreciated that this effect was good. It meant talking to as many people as possible, singly and in groups. It meant listening, explaining, answering questions, clearing up misconceptions. It meant welcoming visitors to the site of the mill. Taking them around and explaining the mill to them. All this is part of being a good neighbor. And part of being a good neighbor is sitting down with other neighbors and discussing common interests. Working with planning commissions, school boards, hospital and welfare committees, and many others in a cooperative effort to solve the problems that bear upon community welfare. When neighbors meet each other halfway, these problems are more easily solved and the whole community benefits. It takes men to operate a steel mill. Even while construction of Fairless Works was in progress, the first of the 6,000 people needed to run the mill were being hired. Most of these came from nearby communities. Steel making is a new career for the majority of them. They were trained by experienced steel makers who had come from other United States steel plants throughout the country. Sessions were held with key personnel to build a training program which would equip new employees for their new jobs and careers.